apostle, one of the, the most amazing ambassadors of Christ, whose truth is woven throughout most of the New Testament. And so here we're going to look at a, a passage, and we're going to focus on one particular verse, and that's verse 6. We're learning verses 1 through 8 here in a little bit. This is about finishing the race. Okay? How many of you have ever run races? There are three things you can count on with a race. Okay? There's a start, there's the race, and there's the finish line. Those are the three facts of any race. You start, you run, and you finish. Paul is approaching his finish line. Out in front of you and I is our finish line. It's inevitable. We were born, we've been living, and there is a finish line awaiting us. Can't escape it. Cannot get away from it. It is the reality of our life that out there in front of us is a finish line. Most of us put that finish line way out in our darkest regions where we don't think about it. And I understand that, okay? It's down the road, maybe 10 years, one year, five years, maybe 30 years, maybe tomorrow. But it's out there. Don't want to contemplate it too much. I don't know what I can expect. My grandfather, who was uh, a young boy, when at the Battle of Little Bighorn and talked great things about it, uh, where Custer was defeated. He lived to be 96. So maybe I'll have that part of my gene pool that I will kind of can count on. However, my mom and my dad both died in their mid-70s. So I might only have 12, 14 years left. Or I might be gone this week. We don't know. The finish line is there. It sounds kind of morbid. But it's what Paul wants us to understand about finishing well, like a drink offering. And my question here is, is, how will you finish this race? How will you and I finish this race? The quick answer is probably the same as how we run it. How we're running this race is probably how we'll finish. And if we're running the race well for Christ, we will finish well. If we're kind of staggering and, and not really uh, in, in step with Jesus during, during our days or our weeks, the race is kind of off course. And it will take a change, just like the change that, that Paul went through. When he went from Saul, the, the, the persecutor of the church, of anybody that associated with Christ, to being one of the greatest ambassadors, his life changed greatly. And he made adjustments to his life. I'm going to tell a quick story that we'll read at the passage here. Um, I've shared this before with you, uh, I think, and if you, if you haven't been here for a long time, then maybe you missed this. But my first year away from home to go to college was at Weber State College in Ogden, Utah. I left with the intention of enrolling and succeeding. Intending. Okay? I was not purposeful about any part of that year at Weber State. I left Weber State, if you know the four-point scale of A, B, C, D, A being the four-point. I left Weber State after one full year of classes with a 0 0.68 grade point average. Okay. I'm humored by that, but not proud of the tip of your faces. <laughs> Should have seen my folks' faces. <laughs> But I left there with what would be called either an F plus. <laughs> That's the way I look at it, rather than a D minus, because F plus sounds better. But I, I left there with that kind of a grade point, that kind of a result, because I didn't run the race well. I didn't go to class. I was away from home. When I did go to class, I didn't pay attention. I didn't crack the books. I missed huge chunks of time. I didn't study with a study group. I didn't seek any kind of accountability to go to class. Nothing. And I finished poorly at Weber State. Okay? When I came to LC, I had two and a half incredible years in which I changed my racing strategy. I actually went to class. What a thing. What a difference it makes when you're really there and you hear things. I cracked the books. I read the books. I took notes. I was engaged with, uh, with buddies who could help me study. I could help them study. And I, my, my grade point average at, at LC was 3.88. Presidents listed the deans. I don't say that to brag, but what happens to the finish line when we change what's going on with our racing has great impact. 
And I make that, I say, share that story to draw us into assessing how we're doing in our race right now and how it correlates to how we will finish this race. Paul wants us to understand the value of several things, and that is certainly keeping in mind the fact that our life will someday come to the finish line. In between now and then, we are called to run the race well. To run the race well. And again, my question is, how is your race going? How are you running? And with that in mind, how will you finish? They are very much connected to one another. Paul's answer to this question is in these sets of passages. And even though we're going to focus on verse 6 predominantly, and, and over the next two weeks, the, the verses before this one and just immediately afterwards, today what we're going to look at is this finishing piece. So let's read verses 1 through 8 of chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. We're going to talk greatly about this next week, about how many, many churches, that call themselves Christian get caught up in that particular area and have to be very, very careful with things. Verse 5. But you, you and I, be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. That is speaking to each and every one of you. Each and every one of you are a minister. You're a minister in how you live. You are a minister in how you speak. You're a minister in how you demonstrate God's love and grace to others. But more importantly, and not more importantly, but equally important is this. You're called to be a part of the ministry of the church that you attend. You're called, let me say that again. You are called as a Christian to be part of the ministry that you attend. If this is your church, if you've been here for a while, what are you waiting for? What is it that you're waiting for in order to plug in and lead, participate, and engage with the ministry that we're called to be in. It says to fulfill your ministry. Don't fulfill Bill's ministry. Fulfill your ministry. That's an incredible truth for all of us to think about and to come. It is, it is part of our race. It is a part of our race. A part of our running it is fulfilling our and your ministry. Whatever that happens to be. Verse 6. Paul says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearance. The last Sunday that we look at the life of Paul, we're going to be looking at these crowns, these rewards of the finished life and having performed and run the race well. Paul says he's being poured out, poured out like a drink offering. Okay? And you think, what the heck does that mean? Okay? At some point in time, our life, as we hold a pitcher of water, we pour our life out. Eventually, the life water will end. Finish life. But in the Old Testament, what he's referring to here is the, the practice of the ritual that when somebody, uh, when a believer would come and bring their offering their lamb, their best goat, whatever it happens to be, they would bring their offering and they would split it in half. Part of it would go on the altar and part of it would go to the priest. Okay? Then it would burn up on the altar. They would burn this offering up. But many of those who uh, were with God would take their either their jar or a cup of wine and they would pour it, not just some of it, but all of it onto the coals. And immediately the wine would evaporate and, and throw off this incredibly fragrant aroma. They would pour all of it out. Nothing saved for me to drink right afterwards or to give to the priest, but all of it out to God. And that's what Paul is referring to here is that it give and it was also wine in, 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 the, in the scriptures is really a, a, an aspect of joy. Why isn't it ironic that the first miracle Jesus performs is turning water into wine? 
He understood two things. One, the value of that, of, of a good wine, but also the value and the, the need to honor and celebrate a wedding in a good way. And the crazy thing about it is he did it just the opposite. Most people would give the, the people who were at the wedding the good wine for a little while until they got a little bit weird. And then they throw out all the bad wine. Just the opposite of what Jesus did. The good wine came at the end. So this joyful aspect and this fragrant aroma would come up and it would signify to all those who are around me that I give all of me to God. Without any hesitation, here is all of my offering. So Paul is saying, I've poured out my life like a drink offering. And he's ready to go home. He's ready because he has, if you could, if you could put two words to all of Paul's life, it would be no regrets. Not one. This man lived firmly, strongly, in the face of all kinds of turmoil and difficulties and challenges and struggles, all for Christ. He was the ultimate ambassador for Jesus Christ. Never backed down from a fight. And I don't mean that he took punches or threw punches at people, but he received punches. But always answered in grace and love. That's an incredible thing. When he was beaten almost to death, dragged out from the city and left outside the walls for dead. He didn't get up and grab the first rock and chuck it at anybody. He got up, healed himself, and went about preaching and teaching who Christ is. Paul is our model, which is why I wanted to look at the life of Paul over the last several months. Because this is what we should strive for. We're going to all fall short. I will fall short every day of this guy's bar. It is so high. But it is something to shoot for, something to aim at, to stand firmly for Christ, whatever the situation is, whatever the challenges are, is, and hold nothing back, is being a drink offering for our God. We're going to take a look. You can keep your finger here in, in uh, 2 Timothy. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians. Just turn back a little ways. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to take, get another look at what this drink offering uh, kind of looks like. It's written in a different way. Written in a way that might make more sense. I don't know. But what, what I want you to pay attention for or listen for is this notion of a drink offering being offering all of me and not holding anything back to God. We're going to start in verse 14 of chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. For the love of Christ controls us. When we allow the Holy Spirit in and allow the Holy Spirit access to us, it is Him that helps us to overcome the flesh. It is He that allows us to open up Scripture rather than watching hours and hours of TV or being on Facebook. It is Him that prompts us to remember Memphis on Wednesday morning. For the power of for the love of Christ controls us. Isn't it great that it doesn't say the power of Christ, but it's the love of Christ that controls us? Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, that they who live should no longer live for who? Themselves. But for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no man according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Brian talked a little while ago uh, during, during uh, worship time about remembering high school days. 30 years ago. Wow, Heather's getting kind of old, isn't he? <laughs> um, but when you think back to either high school days or young adult life or college or even last week, the old is past. In the morning when we wake up, every time we come back to God and get on our knees and repent, we are made new again. That is sanctifying grace that allows us to be refreshed and renewed by His grace each and every day. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation brings out some difficult images for us. If you've ever been in an argument with somebody, the first thing you want to do is reconcile with them, isn't it? It's not the first thing that comes to our mind. But if we practice this ministry of reconciliation and of being a drink offering, it is the ministry of reconciliation that puts my feelings aside, my I'm right attitude, and go and 
reconciled with whoever the difficulty is with. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And just think about God giving Christ to us to reconcile a world that at times hates him. A world that in great chunks of generations turned their back and walked away. And not just walked away, but really cursed at who God is. And yet, he provided the ultimate reconciliation act by giving us his one and only son. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, not for me, not for me, myself, and I, not for ourselves, but for Christ. As though God were entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So at Paul's departure, when he's getting ready to leave, in, in just a short period of time, the Emperor Nero, who I've talked about before, who came to power for over Rome at the ripe old age of 16. Envision any 16-year-old that you know taking over. <laughs> this is actually this, this practical. Just watch Donald Trump for a little while, and you will see a 16-year-old. Imagine any 16-year-old that you know taking over the United States of America. Of course, we probably know some 16-year-olds that you think that you could do better than what the two options are now. Nero was going to be head Paul shortly, and he knew it. Paul knew this end was coming. And what he wants everyone to know, the, the, the church that Timothy was in charge of, the churches that Timothy would go and evangelize and teach at, but also all of the churches from that moment forward, that please finish the race well. Offer yourself out as a sweet drink offering for him. The question that we always ask people is this. What kind of legacy will you leave? What is your legacy? What will it be? When people think about you, when people come and stand over, and sorry for the morbidity here, over to a graveside and see your name, what will the thoughts be? What will they think of you and the legacy that you have left? It's an interesting thing that when, when Jennifer and I were over there, uh, I always go up and sit or talk with my folks. I do. They're, my folks have this headstone that's... Uh, someday I'll tell you the story of why the headstone is kind of falling down like this. There's a big uh, divot in there. I'll tell you about that sometime. But I stand there and we always pick up shells. We bring sand. We bring agates, feathers, sometimes a Hershey bar. And we put them all around the headstone. And Jennifer and I stood over them and prayed. And I think about how much I appreciate who my folks are still. They poured their life in to each of their kids. They did it sometimes successfully and sometimes not. Just like you and I have done. They have... I don't know if my dad's in heaven. I didn't have that real strong conversation with him to find out if he really believed in Jesus Christ. My prayer is that in that moment in which Dad passed into kind of an unconscious state that he and God talked. I hope that. Because God can do anything in the blink of an eye. He can change things. But I don't know if I'll see him. Those of you who have family members who don't believe in Christ, we won't see them. They will be in hell. And remember, as much as we believe in God and heaven, there is a hell. Spiritual dominoes are the steps that we take as we run the race. And, and we hopefully the dominoes fall in a direction that leads people to Christ. Sunday school teacher Edward Kimball, in one of his Sunday school classes, led a young boy, a young man named Dwight Moody, to Christ. J. Wilbur Chapman was converted at a Dwight Moody evangelistic meeting. Billy Sunday, who was a baseball player, was converted at a Chapman meeting. Mordecai Ham, which is a great name, that's just, if I get my next dog, I think it's going to be Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham was converted at a Billy Sunday meeting. Here comes the next one. At a Mordecai Ham meeting, Billy Graham was converted. Legacies. 
Legacies are like dominoes. And if we are running the race well, we will finish well. And not only will we finish well, we, the dominoes will fall in place in which people will be drawn to your racing style. They will be drawn to how you run the race with love, grace, mercy, forgiveness, and the truth of Christ exuding it how you live. These guys were legacy builders. You and I are legacy builders, whether we know it, admit it, or want to ignore it, we are. Every moment you walk, every, there are eyes that watch you. Whether it's from work, neighbors, or family, people watch. The legacy builders build legacies that are strongly attached to God by being attached to God. I want you to write down a scripture. I'm not going to read it right now. But I want you to read this. I'll just kind of summarize it. It's Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. And essentially what it says, uh, let's read it. Turn back to Jeremiah, way back in the Old Testament. Jeremiah, verse 17, or chapter 17. There are two choices in this world. To believe the world and, and follow mankind and its, all of its creations, or to follow and believe what God is. And here's what it says, verse 5 of chapter 17. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. For he will be like a bush in the desert, and we will not see when prosperity comes. But when he, but when, but will live in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant. That's a pretty deserty place. Sometimes people don't even know they're living in the desert. People who are of the world, and even us, when we kind of drift away from Christ, we don't even realize sometimes how parched we are until we get back in the water and go, "Whoa, sorry, I was gone for so long." But the world doesn't know that it's in the desert. But look at this next encouragement. Blessed is he who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green and it will, it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. That is a legacy. A legacy is that which stands firm in the face of struggles and turmoil and the heat of this world, of this life, and maintains a root system connected to the water, to the source, to Jesus Christ His truth, and the gospel message is how we live our life. Paul understood this, understands that uh, this guy more than anybody as we've gone through his life, you, we've seen <coughs> difficulty after difficulty after difficulty after difficulty with this guy's poor life. Not poor life, it's a great life. But wow, any one or two of the episodes that he went through would probably knock me on, off, off my feet. And I would have a difficult time coming back. Paul hung on to the very presence of Jesus Christ and his truth. And that's what got him through. You know what else got him through? Encouragement. People who come alongside and encourage one another. Encouragement helps. Timothy was one of his encouragers. The Barnabas, there were people who were in Paul's life, and he actually writes letters, and we'll talk about them here uh, next week and, and the week after, that please have somebody come and visit me. Bring the parchments. Come and visit me so I can be encouraged while I'm in here. Even though he and God were like this, he still needed the fleshly encouragement of good brothers and sisters, like you and I do. You and I do. People who run long distance hit something called a wall every now and then. That wall can, guy, can knock you backwards. I've only experienced the wall once. And it was when I was in school here, I just graduated, and a friend of mine said, and this guy was a, a, a fought in Vietnam, was an army ranger, just that. And he said, let's go up to Julieta and go in their fun run. I said, yeah, I'm in. So we go up to Julieta and we run this fun run. And when you leave Julieta, you start to climb. Okay? And I'm climbing, man. I'm feeling good. But boy, about two-thirds of the way up there, I'm running out of gas. And he's standing, you know what he did for me? So right, walk, sometimes walk right beside me as we got up on top. And he kept telling me this, you're going to get through this. You're going to get through this. You and I will finish this race. <laughs> and I'm thinking I'm sprinting, and he's walking, because I'm not sprinting. I'm barely plodding along. We're going to get through this, Bill. I'm right with you. I will not leave you. We'll walk. He could have sprinted out of there and been gone, but he didn't. He encouraged me all the way through. But there's this cool thing that happens when you hit the wall if you push through it. It's like you hit overdrive. The endorphins kick in and you just go, whoa, what happened? 
My body, my mind feels better. And I finished the race because he encouraged me when it got difficult. You have brothers and sisters all around you who could use encouragement. You could use encouragement at times. If, if God ever puts on your heart or on your mind somebody, don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. It's God's way of saying, give this person a call. Send this person a card, a letter. Let them know that you're thinking about it. I read a, a, an article this week about a professor at a Christian college, and he and his son went on a, a, a thousand mile backpacking trip from British Columbia to Southern California. A thousand miles, wow. And together, this father and this son, they hiked and they hiked all the mountains of Washington, Oregon, and California. And for many days, they were all alone. And they faced all kinds of obstacles on this thousand mile trek. Lack of food and water, danger from wild animals, thoughts of maybe robbers on the trail which they've heard about. Days of rain, mud onslaughts coming at them, incredible physical exhaustion of hiking that long, and the very real possibility of physical injury that could have happened at any time. But you know what this professor did? First of all, he didn't enter into it lightly. He counted the cost and researched it. And as he researched it, he discovered that over 90% of people who set out to go on a, on a hike that's longer than 500 miles never finish. They don't make it. Of that 90%, 50% never do it. They think about it. How many of you have thought about it and are in this 50% on a thousand mile trek? Yeah, I'd love to do that, but man. 40% quit sometime after they start before they hit the 500 mile mark. That means 10% of the people who think about it actually do it. And he said, I'm going to study this, this 10% and see what it is that they do to get through it. Um, incredible logistical preparation. All the packs, all the thinking, all the uh, uh, preparation that they go through to get there, the physical training, all that they need. But the biggest thing that he discovered that all those 10% people was, how, what got them through, was mental. It was the mental endurance to get through the difficulties. They knew that their real enemies were not out there, but in here. In here. It's the same thing with us with our walk with Christ. They knew that difficulties would come. They knew that they had to continually take one more step forward. When they faced the difficulty, they just needed to take another step forward. Maybe stop for a moment, but then start stepping again. They were not surprised. That's one of the things that he said. He said, you take another step and the crazy people come out of the woods. In our Christian walk, crazy people come into our life. Crazy people come out of the woods and kind of visit with us a little bit from time to time and stretch us and challenge us. And by crazy people, how many of you have been crazy people? I have been. I was crazy enough to think that I could walk away from Jennifer and my family in Portland 20 some years ago. I was crazy enough to think that. Fortunately, I had a friend who understood crazy people. And he, he said to me, you and I are meeting every week. I don't want to meet you. I don't want to have, have you ask me difficult questions. I don't want to have to be accountable to you. So yes, you will be. You know that saved me, that he loved me enough and expected a crazy person <laughs> and loved not a crazy person. We take steps to continue our life. No matter what happened to Paul, he continued his race, knowing full well that difficulties would come. The Christian life is not problem free. It's not, oh, I just blanked on it. No. The Lion King. What is it that they say? Kind of a ah. Means what? How many of you are picturing that stu those stupid animals singing that song? What a great song. A kuna matata means no worries. Christianity means no worries, but expect challenges. The difficulties come. Sometimes they come in bunches, other times they just trickle in, and sometimes they're not there for a while. But difficulties will come. The middle name of every Christian is inconvenience. Christianity is an inconvenient faith, but it is a joy-filled faith. It is a faith. This, this weekend, a good brother of mine is over with a group of men at a Christian retreat called Walk with Christ. It used to be called Walk with, Walk with Nance. Mick, Mick is over there. 
And when, when I took him over on Friday night, or on Thursday night, uh, there's a bunch of men, okay? All these men in this church. And I'm telling you, all you needed was, a, was just some, a quick video to see how much fun it is to be a Christian. And to be gathered around other believers, other men who know what's coming. <coughs> Who know the, the great, incredible, loving surprises that are coming the way, the way for these men who are making their first walk. Lots of workers, lots of people. I would say there are probably 80 men or more that are working this thing. Cooking, cleaning, preparing things, setting tables, speaking, ministering. The pastor, Nick Hasselstrom, who speaks here every now and then, he's one of the pastoral staff. It is a weekend of so much joy, inconvenience. Life is inconvenient sometimes. But it is a joy-filled life to walk the race with Jesus Christ and feel His Holy Spirit pull us and push us and encourage us. Why we need encouragement with everybody. I'm going to end with this. How to finish well. 1 Thessalonians 5. I'm going to read to finish up. Turn back a little bit to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to read the, the one verse that I think is the most important for us as Christians. Because we are all the runners and we're also all the people on the sidelines. We are both of those. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 11. Because of all these things that we've just talked about. Okay? Therefore, encourage one another. And build up one another. Encourage one another means and build one another up implies that we have to get out of ourself and all the things that we think about in order to encourage someone else. In order to step into someone's life to encourage them. Because how often as, as you as a pastor would get this, I don't know, discouraged is a too strong a word, but would, would maybe get bummed out with things. Would it happen often? All of us just because, like Buzz and Lewis and I stand up here, doesn't mean we don't need encouragement. No, I'm not asking you to call, I'll call me this afternoon. Okay? <laughs> what I am saying is that everybody needs encouragement. Needs to be built up. And that happens surely by texting and by calling and by Facebooking, but also by writing someone. Take, how, many, how long has it been since you've taken the time to sit and write a letter by hand? This summer. Think about that for a moment. You know, I have, in, in this Bible and in my other Bible, I have handwritten letters from each of my kids and some from Jeff. At times in which they took the time to say, I think I'm going to write a letter. This is okay. This is a phone, by the way, okay? just in case you know. To text <laughs> someone is okay. Hey, think about it. Hope you're doing well. I do it a lot. <coughs> And sometimes I curse these things or I don't say I don't like them. But it came in real handy on Thursday when Nick and I were driving over to uh, Kenwood, where, which is where this walk is going on, because uh, Michelle called. And while we're driving through the fields of, of, of uh, eastern Washington, I could oh, take this call and talk, and then we prayed. And Nick heard everything, and he put his hand on me when we prayed for Michelle and with us for us. Don't neglect one part of our running the race and that is to reach out and encourage others in this race. Remember that we are the runners, we're in this race and one of the ways that we run the race well is by being connected to one another. Remember earlier I read something that implied you have a ministry. You have a ministry somewhere in this church. But we are all called to run the race in which we encourage one another and we receive that encouragement so we can run the race well and we can finish well. God bless you. Let's pray. God, I am grateful for your word of truth that points us continually back to you, that gives us an opportunity to understand that, Father, in order to finish the race well, we need to run the race well and with connections to you in which we are elbow to elbow with fellow believers, in which not just on Sunday, but certainly Sunday is great, but other times that, God, we are elbow to elbow with one another, in which our steps reflect who you are as we are an ambassador for you as we live our life out. 
So God, I pray for every person here today that God, you would be their source of strength as they run their race. Throughout the day today, throughout this week, that God, you would prompt people to turn continually back to you, to seek you out. Father, I pray that you would do that in me. That God, you would prompt my mind and my heart to call out to you, to be on my knees, to pray to you, to talk with you, and to open up your word, to let it soak my mind so that the world is not what would influence me, but you and your truth would influence me. That your love, your grace, and the realization that your unconditional love for us is mind-boggling and that we would receive it and allow us to be gracious with others in how we treat them and interact with them. Father, bless all those who are here today. May they have a day in which they celebrate who they are in you. And that, Father, you would be blessed by how we live our life. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray these things. Amen. Amen. Okay, so my challenge to you is this. Read the passage that we read today about fulfilling your ministry, and I want you to start praying about it. We're going to come into fall, and all of a sudden the people who have been gone for periods of time will start to come back. Okay? And, and I really want to challenge you to think about it and pray about it. Ask God, what is my ministry? What could be my ministry? Because I guarantee you there's going to be Beth uh, or Heather or somebody standing here during uh, when school begins, and they're going to be pleading with people to help downstairs. Again and again and again. I'm not saying that might be your ministry, but if, even if it isn't, stretch your wings and try something out. We're going to start a men's group again. There's women's ministry things that will be happening. There will be some home groups that will start up. Read that passage and pray. To ask God to help reveal to you what is your ministry? What are you called to be a part of? And this is the last challenge for you. This Wednesday. At 8.45 or thereabouts, in one loud voice, who are you going to be praying for? One, two, three. Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a really good week. Remember, 8.45 on Wednesday. Okay? God bless you.